Welcome everyone to today's episode right here on the School of Radiance podcast. I'm here to help you get the best hair, skin, and nails of your life. And in today's episode, we are going to dive deep with two biohacking babes, all on how biohacking can help us be more radiant, more beautiful, lose weight, and live the life of our dreams with the energy to do so. Today's guest, Melanie Avalon, is a returning guest here on the show, and she is a SAG after a actress, health influencer, biohacker, author of What When Wine, Lose Weight and Feel Great with Paleo Style Meals, Intermittent Fasting and Wine, host of the Melanie Avalon Biohacking Podcast and the Intermittent Fasting Podcast with Vanessa Spina, top Apple creator, food sense guide, and founder of the supplement lines and EMF blocking product lines, Avalon X. Melanie has appeared on the cover of Biohackers Update Magazine and featured speaker in Dave Asprey's 2021 Biohacking Conference and in numerous publications, including USA Today, CNBC, LA Weekly, Forbes, Entrepreneur, Women's Health, and Fox. Melanie Avalon, it's a pleasure to have you here today. How are you? Rachel, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. And we were talking before this, it's really exciting because we finally got to meet in person, sort of recently-ish. Yeah, and uh, this is at the Biohacking Conference. And I'll never forget the way that you approached me with your kindness and your softness. I was really impressed and very happy to see the way that you engage in the world and with others with this energy. This is what I love to talk about. It's all about radiance. What is radiance? How can we be more radiant? And how can we really attract the highest people, situations, and opportunities, and of course, health into our lives? And it's not going to happen by chance. It's going to happen by choice. So Melanie Avalon, I ask everybody here on the show, what is radiance to you? Well, first of all, just just to comment briefly on meeting you as well. Um, it was so, I was in a really vulnerable state for listeners to know because I'd broken my ankle the night before and I was like on the struggle bus. And I, my intention at that moment was to actually like not talk to anybody and just like go in and get my pass and leave. Um, but I saw, it's honestly because I saw you and you were recording a podcast, I think, and you were very magnetic. And I was like, oh, it's like, I can't not go say hi to Rachel. Um, And you were just so warm and comforting and beautiful. And it was just, it was such a beautiful moment. So I was feeling really vulnerable at that moment. Um, So thank you for being there with me then and sharing about it now. But it was just so wonderful to meet you in real life. Fantastic. Um, Isn't that fun though? When you have worked with someone online, because we did interview mm-hmm. each other, and then you get to meet in person, you never know how tall are they, you know, what are they, how are they going to smell, what, what am I going, how am I going to feel being around them? And you know, even despite you having an ankle injury, you still put on a fabulous dress. You did your hair and makeup. You looked absolutely gorgeous. So good job on that. Now the question. What is radiance to you? If you were to describe it, if you were to describe what is radiance to you, what does that look like? What does that feel like in someone else? It's a really, it's a really good question. Um, I just want to describe it with a lot of adjectives. So when I think radiance, I think love and peace and shining and good vibes and high vibrations and really the way it's like, it's an entire feeling that it's really hard to capture in words as well. Like, you know, when you're feeling radiant, um, yeah. Do people, I'd be really curious what people say. Do you get all different answers? Oh, I hear all sorts of things. You know, clear skin, kindness, warmth. I feel like what I hear the most is that it's a vibe. It's an Mm -hmm. energy. It's how someone feels around someone else. And one of the key things to being excellent in social situations is making people feel comfortable. That's like etiquette, social etiquette one-on-one, making people feel comfortable and happy to be around you. But on the flip side of that, someone I think who's operating radiantly and also as a biohacker too, you're not going to be eating all the different types of food that are available 
in restaurants or all the snacks that you see on the grocery shelves, nor are we going to be hanging out with everybody else. (laughs) So I feel like when we really learn a little bit more about radiance and living radiantly, it comes down to being more selective and really purifying things. What do you think about this concept of becoming radiant through purification, which biohacking can help us with? Yeah. So I have so many thoughts on this. Um, One is that I think the purification is so important because like, you know, and like we talk about the world today is very toxic. Um, Just literally with the ingredients in our food, our skincare, our makeup, the EMF exposure, which I know you and I are both really passionate about. That's just a wash everywhere. Um, The culture today is also very uh, intense and, you know, people, it's very opinionated and people seem to be a bit combative today as well. So I think purifying is really, really important. And, um, the, the irony about it that I'm thinking about is that rate, the idea of radiant, going back to the radiance idea, like the, the idea of radiance is so expansive and then thinking about purifying or, um, you know, reforming feels almost constrictive. So it's like, how do you, you know, bring these two together? Like how do, how do they happily marry? Um, so I think it's really important because I know for me and my own personal biohacking journey is I definitely had a point in time where I was scared, like where that, where the need to purify or detoxify was coming from a place of fear. And so it was really about like, you know, just what could I take out? And I had to just restrict, restrict because I needed to, you know, only bring in like the really healthy things. And I don't think that mindset is helpful either. So it's a really delicate balance of how do you, you know, be continually expansive and still be, like you said, use this word like purifying. Well, it's interesting you use the word restrictive. So if we're thinking from like calorie perspective or from a fasting eating window, there's restrictions with that, but there's a purpose with it, right? It's not like a restriction that doesn't have an end goal in mind, which is to stimulate autophagy. And I did, I was telling you earlier, I did a long fast in Sedona and Southern Utah in late 2022, and it completely changed my physiology. So that was an, a time when there was restriction, I think that word is actually a good word choice in some instances, but then also the flowing, where's the flow with that? And that's a very feminine quality. So restrictive is very masculine and feminine is, is more flowy. So I think what it comes down to is balancing, Mm -hmm. balancing the restriction with, with being in a, a more flowing state, which is very feminine. You also mentioned something really interesting here. So I'd love to get into the psychological benefits of biohacking, which obviously are going to help our relationships and just our overall stress levels, because you touched on something in our culture today and you hit the nail on the head. It's about really division. But what I think is happening in culture today is there's actually a scrambling I think there's a scrambling of our psychology and I think that the higher levels of environmental toxins that are available today that unfortunately impact us are contributing to this. What are your, what are your thoughts? Because you mentioned the culture being divided. I think it's a bit of, it's, it's related to toxins, both seen and unseen. What are your thoughts on that? I think it's a lot of things. I haven't sat down and thought about what is like the one thing that's creating all of the the issues today. Um, and it's so interesting because I, so I have a podcast as well and I'm interviewing people a lot and it's really interesting how people can have completely different views on the root cause of this, particularly in regards to society. So my example is I, um, so back to back, like the same week I interviewed one author who she, she's amazing. Um, actually her name is Loretta Bruning and she does a lot of research on animals, um, and their behavior. And a lot of her books are about our happy neurotransmitter chemicals today. So like endorphin, dopamine, serotonin. Um, and she makes the argument that basically 
the way our happy chemicals work, um, it's very similar to the animal kingdom. And we, we basically interpret it as a problem today or, or an issue from society when it's just how our brains work. So the example is like dopamine, like things making you happy. Like it's only supposed to make you, quote, temporarily happy. And then you go for the next thing because it's, um, you know, it's a reward stimulus to keep you alive evolutionarily. Or like serotonin encourages that or is involved in hierarchy, hierarchy status with you know, how we relate to each other. So her ultimate thesis, I know that was like a lot of meandering words, but her ultimate thesis is that we blame society for our mental health issues, our anxiety, our depression, when it's just the way our brain is. And once we have agency to realize that, then we can, you know, take charge of it ourselves. Um, then on the flip side, that same week, I also interviewed um, somebody who wrote a book about perfectionism, which was fascinating because I, I don't know about you, but I sort of identify as a perfectionist. Um, and his ultimate thesis at the end was that it was coming from society. So it was like the complete opposite um, ideas there. Like, is, so, you know, are these things coming from society or are they coming from us? And then there's like a third, you know, aspect that you were just mentioning that maybe there's this third party external factor with the toxins and all of that affecting our brains and how we relate to each other. So as far as what I think, um, and I was also talking about this with another guest, um, I think it's, I mean, it feels like a cop out to say everything, but um, I think that definitely the EMFs, the toxins and all of that are affecting our mental, our mental health, our wellness, our ability to, like you said, be radiant, be calm, be centered. So we're coming from a place where it, it's like set up against us to exist in a, a world of understanding and peace because of all those toxic factors. And then I think that also goes into society and then they just kind of like feed back on each other because it becomes a zeitgeist. And um, I had one other, one other thought about it, um, that just that it's a self-perpetuating cycle. Um, yeah. So I think it's, I think it's, oh, and then well, social media. So now we, cause, now we see it. I had all. a feeling you were going to go there. Yeah. I was like, I know there's, a, I know there's like a third thing. Um, so now I don't think, I don't think social media is actually causing it, but I think it shows us. I think it, we're exposed now to seeing things that we wouldn't have been able to see before. It's kind of like the like processed food being the refined dopamine sparking version of food. Social media is like the refined. Um, like with serotonin, like these hierarchies and the social status, we, it's just like, it's like a drug version of that. So um, I think we see it. I think ultimately it's us that is the um, causing the issue. I don't think it's like society causing it, but I think it all just feeds, it feeds and feeds each other as a self-perpetuating cycle. That was a, mm -hmm. a long long commentary. No, those are all really great points. <laughs> Love being able to connect with people you know, in both of our networks, on both of our shows, to have these really interesting conversations. I think I'm at a thousand interviews now on oh, wow. you know, my show and then also on others. And the things that you learn and talk about can be so meaningful and have you start to think about things in a different way. So when we're talking about root causes, my opinion of root cause is the environmental side of things. Because there's no point doing a weight loss routine. There's you know, I don't think you're going to have as much psychological wellness, mental health improvement if you're toxic. So from a root cause position, definitely reducing toxins, air, water, lighting, electromagnetics. You and I are both complete nerds on EMFs. I'm wearing my EMF long johns underneath my adorable little golf polo and dress pants. You never know. <laughs> so there's definitely the environmental toxins. Then there's also blood type. I think that our blood type impacts our brain's mechanisms and neurotransmitters more than we realize. And if you look at the different blood types, A, B, A, B, and O, they have different qualities to their personalities. And we know through biohacking, through nutrition optimization, 
that we can eat the right foods for what our epigenetics and what our body needs at this time, but there's an overlap with blood type. So I think blood type is an important thing. Social media, if you're a biohacker, your flex on social media isn't, you know, how expensive your handbag is, it's your sleep score. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so one of the things I think that actually happens in the biohacking world and in the personal and professional development side of things is this perfectionism. And that's one of the things that I really learned to overcome. But don't don't get me wrong, when I get a hundred percent sleep score on aura or eight sleep, you know, it's a it's a really good day. I'm I'm curious though, if the way that you live, the way that you feel, having, you know, we've both been biohackers for a number of years now. Do you really think that biohacking is the new beauty secret? If say you've engaged with friends who you haven't seen in a couple of years, you're the one, you're the odd one out in the group being a biohacker and nobody else is. What are they saying to you? Are they noticing that you're slowing your aging? So I, it's just funny because this has happened to me so much recently, not me, but me meeting people who recently have gotten more into the biohacking world because I think it is becoming more and more popular, which is very exciting. Um, but they always kind of tell the same story, which is similar to what you just said in that they made these changes and, you know, now people, so many people are commenting and like, I, I'm usually the one that like commented that started this conversation, um, about, you know, how they look and how they're glowing. And, um, I mean, I've been like dabbling with this for like probably a decade now. And, I don't want to say it's like obvious, but it's like, to me, it's just so obvious. <laughs> it's now that I've been doing it so long. Um, the, the effect that it has on, you know, being like a beauty secret or something. I can't believe it's like, drives, just drives me a little bit crazy thinking about how like in high school and even beginning of college, I thought the beauty secret was all about finding like the right makeup product or finding like, right. So I really thought, yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> like the right eyeshadow, the right. And once actually, interestingly, cause I first started, I, it's a long story about how I got to what I'm doing today, but I first went low carb, um, and then paleo and, and intermittent fasting was all in there, but I started all of that for weight loss. But the, one of the first things I immediately noticed was how my, how it changed my skin. Like my skin started glowing. I'd always struggled with acne that was clearing up. Um, so I really think, yeah, I really think this stuff is the, the secret to anti-aging and finding the most, it, it's a, it's a tricky subject because just the concept of external beauty and the value that we add to that. But, um, I want everybody to feel as beautiful in their own skin, whatever that means to them. And I think biohacking is a beautiful way to do that. I agree. Well, I'd love to hear more about your story. You have been on the show once before. I'd love to hear where you're at now. And before we do that, I'd love to add that beauty follows health. Radiance follows health. And it doesn't matter how old you are. And I've observed this in individuals since 2011. The most radiant people that I work with and serve and support are aged 60 to mid-90s. Hmm. They're actually, some of them come across as more attractive than someone who is in their 20s and 30s. And just because you have health stuff going on doesn't mean that taking care of yourself, grooming yourself, using clean products isn't going to make a difference in your beauty. You might be going through something on your health journey, whether it's an autoimmune thing or a thyroid condition or hormones are off or you're just stressed out and burned out. Just start somewhere. Start somewhere on your biohacking journey, especially with purification first. If you're going to do one thing, stop drinking tap water, go to filtered instead, get some natural sunlight, AM and PM, go barefoot outside, start to employ these things, just, you know, one or two things at a time. So I think that beauty truly follows health and radiance because someone could be pretty and good looking on social media in their twenties and thirties. But then all those toxic products are going to end up keeping up with them, right? The phthalate perfume that goes right over the thyroid. It's mm -hmm. the ironic part here, right? So tell everybody a little bit more about your story and what got you into biohacking, what you've noticed 
how it's really actually changed your life for the better too. Sure. And also just comment on something you just said. Um, the the water aspect and the hydration, the show I'm the reason I'm thinking about this is the show I'm prepping right now is for high silica water, which I had no idea about. I didn't realize the profound role of silica in skin health and hair health. And I'm like, where have I been? Like, <laughs> so that that's literally like last night and the night before, all I was doing was reading studies about silica or silicone. I still have to like figure out all the different, there's like different versions of it. Um, so yes, that's just, a t- that's my recent obsession. Um, so my journey, yeah, I, I got into the, the biohacking world because I experienced an array of health issues after graduating from college and moving into an apartment with mold and, um, it was leaking, the, the oven was leaking carbon monoxide every night, which was not good. And I was also just really stressed adrenally. Um, so I just started trying all these different things to try to feel better. And this was before biohacking was, you know, even remotely a well-known thing. I, I probably, um, the first like quote biohacking thing I ex- was exposed to was our mutual friend, Dave Asprey. I was listening to his show. Um, but I just started trying all the things and actually I think, I, I think it started cause I was trying to sleep like cause my insomnia was so bad, but, um, it was things like blue light blocking glasses and, um, a lot of like sleep temperature things and everything that made me everything a lot of things really, really worked. And then I just had this incessant need to tell people about it um, because not not to make people do it, but when something really aff- affects me profoundly, I want to share it with people. So ultimately podcasting became an amazing avenue for that. I'm so grateful for for podcasting. So, but there, I, I don't know, I've experienced, I experimented with so many things and now, and you're probably similar, now it's like there's a new biohacking product literally like every day. And I feel like I'm getting samples of things to try every day. It's really exciting. Like the thing yesterday I did was, um, it was so cool. It was a, um, it's an age rate test. I don't know if it looks at your telomeres or what type of biological age it looks at, but that's what I was doing yesterday, for example. And it was this really weird, like to take your blood. Have you seen this? I don't know if you saw my story, like to take your blood, you like put it on your arm and then it just like drips blood into a tube for like five minutes. (laughs) I was like, what is happening? Um, it's really exciting to see the technology evolve with everything. So, yeah. I agree with you. There's always new things coming out. And this is the big issue that my clients and obviously those lovely listeners here on the School of Radiance podcast is that it gets expensive. Biohacking is for the elite. I'm here to tell you it's not. The first biohacks that I did to add to kind of like our story the first biohacks I did I was cold plunging, circadian rhythm balancing, grounding. I have been really interested in energy for a very long time. We're talking since 10 years old, being really captivated by magnetism and things like hydrogen fuel cells. I was 10 years old, crying out loud. <laughs> so I've loved to look at how some of these new newer technologies are coming out and they're helping us feel better, sleep better, and also improving the fields that we are in and potentially even consciousness. Yes, this is definitely something interesting, but I've been able to quantify some of these things through analysis of the human biofield and measurable dual output. Hello, mitochondrial function. So yes, with new things coming out all the time, here's a rule of thumb I like to have. I have a seven to eight year rule. And this is actually coming from my experience in medical aesthetics with injectables, with lasers, with new innovative body sculpting surgeries. You always want to wait so that you don't end up wasting your money. But here's the flip side, wasting your time and money. Here's the flip side with biohackers. We want to try absolutely everything. And we are willing to be a little bit of a guinea pig ourselves. What are your thoughts on that of being okay with trying things out. And I actually don't like to use that word instead of trying, I'd rather do, but when we're trying something new, <laughs> yeah. we're analyzing it. What, what are your thoughts on that? Trialing maybe would be a good word. Um, so yes, it's, it's a good comparison you're making compared to like cosmetic procedures and things like that. Um, I am, I am trying, trialing new things all the, like literally all the time. And 
there's not really, I'm just thinking everything I've tried, there hasn't really been a, I've never tried, not, nothing really comes to mind that I tried where there was the potential for, you know, severe negative effects or, or, you know, bad effects. So the, the return on investment is usually good with the exception of, like you said, things can be really expensive and unapproachable. So, um, I love the idea of trying things all the time. I'm really grateful that a lot of brands and products will, will send me their products. So, um, but if I was not being sent a lot of stuff all the time, I would probably want to do more, um, it, depending on the cost, I would want, I would, the cost would probably be the, the biggest factor, cost and time. So, you know, is it costing a lot? Is it costing a lot of time? And what is the potential return on investment with that? Um, compared to if it costs less and it doesn't take much time, then I say, you know, try all the things. So I think people have to make their own decisions for that. That was a really swick, s- slick tweak, tongue, tongue twister and a half, on trying to trialing. And trialing absolutely is the highest word choice when you are considering looking into biohacking. People that say trial all the time, they don't actually do and they usually don't complete things. And are oftentimes a little bit more unhappy with themselves than someone who does and completes something, even if they fail along the way a couple times. Love this idea of trialing. Love that you also brought up ROI, return on investment of technology and time spent learning about new tech and applying it and utilizing it. I would say the biggest measures for an ROI on something is going to be sleep and energy. And I would say the skin stuff follows as long as it's improving sleep energy and reducing oxidative stress. So if something gives me a one or 2% edge with my sleep, with my energy, with my relationships, with finances, with faith, with family, it just makes me a better human, then I'm going to be into that and I'll take it. And what's cool about what we do, Melanie, is the companies that we work with, our community, they trust us, right? They know that we're not about to talk about something that is total fluff because we don't take these companies and our community members trust lightly. So that's where also for us aligning with different brands and companies that have shared values, that we can tell that they're not just a multi-passionate, you know, CEO of a million different companies just looking to make money. I'm sure you've come across that too in the biohacking world, the people that are just in it for the money making products. How quickly do you, do you suss that out? I'm curious. Yeah. Um, and sorry, cause there's so many things I want to comment on as well. Um, so just to quickly comment on the, the return on investment thing. Is it okay if I go on a quick tangent just before before your second question? Um, Absolutely. Tangent away, Melanie. Perfect. So I'm so glad that you brought up the the sleep aspect because I do think because I was thinking about what we were just talking about, about you know, where to where to trial and where to put your time and money. And there's a lot of biohacking, awesome biohacking products and things out there, but they're they're more for like evaluative, or I think later down the line when you've already addressed the the foundational aspects. So for example, like that age rate, age rate test I was taking yesterday, which I haven't received the results yet, yet. Um, but that's going to presumably tell me like how my biological age is. Um, it's probably better if you're having, if you're new to biohacking to start with the things that are going to really make an immediate effect. So like supporting sleep, like you said, um, and you can do that with a lot of free things, like just turning down the temperature cold at night and wearing, you know, black, using blackout curtains, you know, keeping things dark. So, um, but I think one of the biggest return investments is something like a continuous glucose monitor, for example, where yes, it might be a little bit more of an investment, but it will change the way you see how you approach food. And we know with skin health in particular and high blood sugar levels, like glycation that has, you know, has a huge effect on skin. So I just wanted to like throw out some things out there like that. Um, coming back to your question about people in it for the money. So the majority of the people that I have personally interacted with, with biohacking companies, um, it's really interesting. I haven't come across a lot of people like that 
type. You know, I, I haven't had a lot of experiences where I felt like the person was creating this biohacking thing just for the money. So many of the people behind these different brands and products are often very mission driven, really passionate. Um, and I think that might be un- a little bit unique because it is an industry based on, you know, health and wellness where a lot of people, because, okay. So like these really random products, I think those are hard sells often for becoming the next big thing. Um, like making like a really rogue biohacking type device is not going to be the, the biggest thing to necessarily like put all your money on. <laughs> That's what I'm doing behind the scenes though. There's all, <laughs> yeah. all this cool stuff and cool tech that I can't talk about publicly because people are really like, what are you on about now, Rachel? But I'm like, this stuff works. I slept next to something. I kid you not. I had four hours of sleep. I woke up. I felt like I slept for nine. Wow. So there, yeah. there, there's some, if you think biohacking's fringe, the, oh my gosh, there's like this whole other sphere of fringe in my world. No, I <laughs> so love it. random products. And like, and, and so like the point being is like, I feel like the type of people innovating those type of products are usually coming from, they're usually passionate about it. Um, and it usually is coming from a reason. There's usually a reason they're doing it. That's not the money per se, because like I said, like we just said, it's not something you can just like walk up to a, a you know, a wall of investors and it's going to sound super like invest in that. Um, but things are changing, I think. Well, what's funny about this is that some of the really neat tech that I use behind the scenes, mm-hmm. forget about the inventor and the creator of this being on shows and podcasts. These are complete mega nerds, total recluses. <laughs> investors would be like, what? But I mean, this is really meaningful technology that I'm drawing to use every single day. So it's funny with the biohacking stuff. It's got to be marketable. It's got to be shiny. There's got to be a good team behind it. Yes, it's got to be attractive to investors. Is there a subscription model along with it? Or there's, you know, the things that are kind of difficult to explain, difficult to market, but they provide quantifiable results. So it's, I'm curious to see where biohacking is going to be in a couple of years. I think it's going to be more toward energy. And I know that you are, I think, equally as passionate about electromagnetic frequency mitigation. And the biggest ROI on my sleep for getting 100% sleep scores across the board is actually sleeping in EMF protective clothing. So what are your thoughts on that, Melanie? Yes, I am so passionate about this. Um, I think what's a little bit, what's a, what's a, um, a barrier to all of this is that, so EMFs are classified by the IARC as group 2B, and that means possibly carcinogenic to humans. And it, it basically means that there are studies showing that it could be, that these electromagnetic frequencies could be um, carcinogenic. And that's like, that's not a, a, a vague woo-woo society that's like official, you know. <laughs> I wish um, shadow banned so hard in 2016, 2017 on social media because I was talking about EMFs. Now everybody's talking about EMFs. I'm not shadow banned yeah. anymore, by the way. Well, it's crazy. So if you go into your iPhone, if you have an iPhone, and you go into the legal section – there's a. I have, I have two iPhones actually. Oh, <laughs> yeah. But you know what? Here we go. Guess what? They're both on airplane mode. Nice. Seriously. See? Yeah, and yeah, we can talk about like all the simple steps you can do to just dramatically reduce your exposure. Um, but if you go into the legal section of your phone, there's a section called RF exposure, I think. And it's funny because you can tell that the legal department wrote it, so they don't they don't outright come out and say that the phone is bad for you, but they put a lot of disclaimers in there. So they basically say that the phone is tested to be safe by certain standards of um, EMF, of radio, of RF exposure, I think is what they call it. Um, But then they say that, you know, if the phone is used differently, that it might no longer, that might, might no longer apply. And then it even says it recommends you use the phone on speakerphone. So and hands free. How are you supposed to use your hands hands free? Just curious. Yes. For a friend. So <laughs> I'm just saying, like, 
if if Apple is they're not they're I, I can promise you they're not having a random board meeting where they're like you know what it'll really be a nice thing to tell that we officially recommend people use speakerphone like if they're putting that in there they had to put that in there mm-hmm. um so but they again it's very nice language like it doesn't come off but basically they're like yeah it's a problem you should, basically it says basically it says you should not be holding it by your head yeah. <laughs> um, use it hands-free which kind of yeah. means don't use it yeah you so, Siri and said oh but then you have speaking of tracking biohackers are all about tracking data mm-hmm. but i mean do you really want all your conversations tracked too i'm not so sure about that one yeah it's <laughs> um it's a lot so that's why so these right here we were talking before recording um these are emf free so the radiation because okay well backtracking when people use like AirPods with Bluetooth, don't just... even get me started on that. If anyone here is listening to this episode with with a wireless Bluetooth headset, you need to like remove those from your physical body, as well as the smartwatch. It's destroying your nervous system and your blood. And I so one thing I love about podcasting is I don't have to. I don't ever actually go up to anybody and tell them what to do. Like I just create content about what I'm learning. I share it, and then if people want to listen, they can listen. I really don't want to like enforce my opinion on anybody. Like people, people do, do what you want. There's one thing where I get the urge to be like, "Mm, don't do that. And it's when I see people with AirPods, I'm like, I know, right? But they think Um, if they put this little sticker on the AirPod, it's going to be okay. Yeah. I mean, just think about, you're basically putting like an antenna right by your brain. We know it's affecting the calcium channel of your cells. Um, If iPhone is telling you not to even use the iPhone like, like that, then it's Keep basically saying don't use it. Basically. Use it hands free. Yeah. Okay, iPhone. Thank you. Thank you for so, that product recommendation. <laughs> um, so one better step is using like Apple um or whatever brand, but normal wired is better, is way better than so like ha- speakerphone or wired. There's still the issue of a normal, and I'm like, I know this is on video and some people are listening, but the radiation can still travel up wired to your head. So that's why I'm so excited. And right now I have on a sample because I'm making some that are, the radiation basically stops at, again, I'm showing a video, but it's, it's where like the, um, the mic piece would be for the air for the, for your, um, it's like a little bubble. Headphones. Yeah. Yeah. So that's where it stops. And then after that, it's just, um, plastic. I know, I know we don't like plastic <laughs> it's a whole tangent, but, um, it doesn't conduct radiation up to your head. So yeah, it's I'm, changing the frequency from a digital sound wave to then back to acoustic. So when we're talking and we're chatting and connecting, having, having a great time, I don't have a headset in here. So I'm getting your voice and a full acoustic audio. Well, I mean, it's still going from digital, but because it's sound waves and it's not wired, then it's, then it's considered acoustic. Uh, I've been a musician for a long time, so I love, I love to nerd out on those things. So I'm so happy for you to be creating a solution for this as well. Anything else we need to know about your tips for EMF mitigation? But I, before that, hold on a second. Getting back mm-hmm. to some of the EMF studies, there's legit PubMed research articles now mm-hmm. on the effects of EMFs on the skin and eyes, creating redness and irritation. That's mm published published research now but i got shadow banned in 2016 2017 over it so anything else you'd like to nerd out about with emfs yeah no thank you for sharing those studies and it's just it's really i don't like using like words that have negative energy around them like frustrating but it is frustrating that um that there's legitimate science behind it but it's for for whatever reason it's become you know on the the shadow ban like the controversial list so um yeah in any case tips. Um, Well, the good thing about, or one of the good things about these frequencies is that they dramatically drop the farther away things get from you. So even with your phone, holding it close versus farther away makes a a big difference in the exposure to that. Um, That same goes with like the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and all the different devices. Um, So anytime you can use airplane mode, a reason, especially in the biohacking world, people wear wearables to monitor their all their biometrics and everything. The reason I chose Aura, not the reason, but a reason I chose Aura Ring to monitor my sleep and activity and all of that was because it does have an airplane mode, which is wonderful. Um, Turning off your Wi-Fi at night 
is so, so important. I'm neurotic about that. Um, and I, and so there is, you know, EMF blocking clothing, which again, people feel, they think that's like woo woo, but it's just literally block. It's just a material that is Half literally my body blocking it. is protected right now. Partially yes. because I literally have a router right behind me and I need to operate. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know. Right. Uh, that's the other thing. So I know this is like a big, huge step, but if you're like looking at apartments or looking at a house, if you can find one where the bedroom, where like the central, like the thing with all of the outlets, what is it called? Circuit breaker and everything. Like if that is not in your, your bedroom, which in my apartment here it is, which is annoying. But um, <laughs> I sometimes that's get scared can- because you mentioned looking at places. And yes, I've been staying in some rentals while in Florida. And I've had a lot of fun with this. Finding a place as a biohacker. Because number one, you have to bring your EMF. I like, I kid you not, this is what I do. I bring my EMF reader. One time I didn't, but I had a headache after viewing the property. I'm like, oh, for sure. Yeah. I'm really <laughs> blasted by EMFs, 100%. So you got, here you go. This, this is if you're going to look at a new home to purchase or somewhere to rent or where you are right now. In your handbag, simply place your EMF reader, your moisture meter to detect mold, mm behind the walls. I've been dealing with massive leaks actually at this place I'm in now. Florida too is just a nightmare. So we've got our EMF reader. We have our water meter. You can also bring a meter to test the tap water. (laughs) You could also do that too. So those would be the three readers that I would say to take with you when looking at a place. It's just ridiculous. And then you have to consider the lights, can you dim them? Say, yeah. Can you turn off the LEDs? Is there a halogen lamp option situation? Can you get outside and ground, right? Can you go barefoot easily without having to go down a bunch of stairs and go outside? Can you see water? There's so many funny things that I have to consider now when I look for a place. Oh, the other thing. The other thing is night vision goggles. Mm, like legitimate night vision, like tactical night vision goggles for identifying areas of coolness and moisture behind the wall. And you'll never guess whose house spotted mold in with night vision goggles. I'll give you a hint. It starts with a D. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really? So you want to take when you look for places. Is your EMF reader, your moisture meter for the walls, your water meter, and night vision goggles. Do you think that's too much? Not at all. Um, I'm just inspired now because I have there. I have night vision. I think they're night vision binoculars. Could I use those? Oh, completely. <laughs> yeah. Have fun with it. They, and they've been sitting there. My grandfather gave them to me, and they've been sitting there. Oh, and I fun. never. I was like, what am I going to use these for? Well, I know. Okay, that's your wow, grandfather. That's, that's so cool. I know. I know. It, it was funny as he gave it to like all of us and I somehow ended up with all of them. So I have like three things of like really expensive night vision binoculars. Like they're in my list of like stuff to deal with. So I'm going to pull them out for that. Mm-hmm. This um, is going to be your party trick, Melanie. I know. Go over to people's homes. You're like, look uh, what I have in my handbag, ladies and gentlemen. Let's look and see if you have water damage or mold. That's crazy. <laughs> that's amazing. Okay. It's actually really uh, fun. <laughs> that's really fun. I'm going to, I'm going to start doing that. And, um, yeah, the mold thing is, oh, really just really quick comment. I remember when I was looking for my apartment now and I found one apartment and I was so torn because it was so the light, speaking of the light, um, it did not have good lighting. So it did not have a lot of like windows. It didn't have bright light during the day. So that was a no go. But because of that, the bedroom, like at, when he turned off the lights was like, a cave. And I was like, wow. I was like, I would sleep really well. <laughs> so it was like, do I go with the darkness at night, but sacrifice light during the day? I ultimately went with more light during the day with a room that has um, a little bit more light exposure at night. Cause it's, I think it's easier to black it out than to add light. Um, which that's a whole tangent. Cause now I, I love this tangent though. This, you know, uh, <laughs> biohackers, we have our own kind of fun. We have our own kind of humor. Yes, I know. Um, so the tangent there is like red light and near infrared therapy. I've been obsessed with for so long. I think it's very popular in the biohacking world. I love it. I also was 
wondering if I was being a bit not myopic, if I was like maybe not considering, if I was being too focused on like one certain type of wavelength of light. Um, I finally recently found a, a company that makes full spectrum light that is not because a lot of people will get like the daylight or like the sad lights for um, like during the day, but those are actually not all full spectrum. They're high in blue light. They're filtered. They filter out the UV. They can be possibly just exacerbating the issue. So I found a company where they make full spectrum. It's like sunlight. Um, they, it even has UV in it, but not they tone it down. So not like um, a cancer promoting. It's just a tiny, tiny bit. Um, but I'm, that's something I'm really excited about. That's my new like light obsession is full spectrum light. So watch iPhone come out with a light for seasonal affective disorder and they have a legal disclaimer. By the way, don't have the light too close to you or something. Oh, yeah, like probably. I can see that. I can see that. Yep. Oh, this, so. is, this is so much fun, Melanie. We're just nerding out left, right, and center. Okay, here's a question I have for you. Very serious here. Mm-hmm. It's just fun when two biohackers come together. They can, you know, share notes and tips and tricks, right? You have a new party trick now. I know. I'm going to bring my night binoculars <laughs> to parties. <laughs> It's going to be super cool. I love it. Pass it to a young man and say, can you find any water damage here? And he'll give him a mission and then he'll be all in his masculine. He'll love it. Well, I I will say party tricks. So um, I love wearing now transdermal NAD patches and they have like a black patch that goes over them. And I think they go really well with black dresses. And so now every time I go out, especially if I'm like drinking, um, even though that's a whole tangent, I like to... I have my methods of trying to find the wine, the wine as closest to dry farm wines as possible when I'm out. So like low alcohol, low sugar, organic. Um, that said, having a transdermal NAD patch the whole night has been a game changer for me, and I think it it's a and I think it looks beautiful with black dresses or anything, and um, it's a great conversation starter. People are always, people are always like, what is what is that? Or if you're wearing a CGM, same thing conversation starter. Yeah. I mean, it's also a conversation starter in the airport too. So my last flight, (laughs) this is Mm -hmm. a fun episode for me to record with you, Melanie. Thank you. (laughs) Going from the East coast to West coast, seven hour flight. I wore my NAD pouch as well. I also have some NAD here too. I love NAD for energy. The, just an FYI, the, the Qualia one, this isn't like a paid ad or sponsor or anything. Um, that one, I feel like I've had like two cups of coffee. I think I took one of them today. So transdermal patch flying. Here's what you need to know. The airport staff are going to be like, what is this? Because actually it triggered something. So I don't know if it's the NAD solution itself or something in the fabric, but just be aware if you are traveling and you opt to not go through the scanner. I mean, don't get me started on that. I'd, I'd be a yellow blob if I went through that scanner because I'm always traveling and flying in my EMF gear. That's so funny. So it is a conversation starter in the airport too. And What, what brand do you use of the transdermal? Uh, it, the symbol is a figure eight. Is it, oh, ion layer. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Ion That's layer. weird that it's set off because I've, cause I've gone like through it. now recently three, like three or four or five times. The UK security was not having me. They were... <laughs> can, can I tell you what happened? Oh, don't even get me started on if there's any crystals in a bag. Oh my goodness! Biohacking yeah, tag. Oh my gosh. Yeah, this this is next level biohacking world problems right here. And well, I'm glad we're talking about this though, because that's something easy. It's just opt out of the the scanner. Um, well, Every it's time, otherwise it's I show up the yellow blob anyway. And you get a free massage. Well, I don't know about that. I wouldn't go that. <laughs> I would not go that far because they make you wait for I like fifteen so. twenty minutes and things like that. They they do. Um, it, it was funny I don't though. Know what kind of massages it, you're used to getting, Melanie? Well, I don't. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I just. I like to reframe it. Um, I know, but um, it's funny because in the U.S., they're relatively. I found okay with me opting out. Like it's just like. They're like, because this is America and like you can do what you want. But like, like I said, when I went to the UK, TSA, mm-mm. they were like, why do you want to opt out in the British accent, of course? And I was like, because I don't want the the radiation. And they were like, that's not a reason. And I was like, it is in the US. And they were like, this isn't the US. 
And I was like, I don't want to. And then they were like, <laughs> they were like, is it medical or personal? And I was like, it's personal for medical. And they were like, that's not a reason. Like everything I said. <laughs> and I was like, I'm not going through. <laughs> so yeah. But it's interesting that you're sorry, that your patch set it off because then they took me into a room and scanned it and they didn't have any issues with it. So I wonder what that's weird. I don't um, know. Maybe they were just curious. But yeah. anyways, interesting, interesting. Okay, let's jump to alcohol. I'm all about making really good decisions 99% of the time. So that if I would like to live in moderation and be the official cookie taste tester around the holidays, I might just take that job up. Or if I want to have a little bit of alcohol in a social setting, have a beautiful food and wine pairing, I have some specific alcohol that I will go to and what I tend to avoid, otherwise I have a raging headache and don't feel good and don't sleep well. What are your recommendations for alcohol? I know you're a huge fan of dry for mine, but this, this is kind of your wheelhouse, right? What, when, wine. Tell us the down low on what we need to know about alcohol and for looking our best. Yes. So, and now I'm just thinking about the tangent of how I was researching silica. Like I said, silica water. And I haven't forgotten. Don't worry. It's coming. Oh, no, 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 no. Just the, the relationship to it is that the study I was reading, they were looking at the um, one of the Framingham cohorts and they found in that cohort that alcohol intake correlated to um, in, increased bone density, um, which that, so that's a, that's like a one thing. But then the paper I was reading, they were positing that it was actually the beer because apparently beer is high silica. And so they thought it, they think it's the beer, the silica aspect that was the bone density connection there, not the alcohol. And but in any, yeah. In any case. Um, so people can debate for a very long time about, you know, alcohol. Is it conducive for health and longevity? Is it um, a toxin and none is better than any. I think that the majority of the studies, if you look at everything, definitely correlationally, moderate alcohol intake seems to be better than complete abstinence and definitely better than, you know, um, extreme drinking, which is not good. Um, so again, if you step back, if you look at the long, the world's longest populations, I mean, I know blue zones, people will debate that, but, um, they all drink alcohol with the exception of Loma Linda in California. Um, so I think there are benefits to minimal to moderate alcohol consumption. And I think it's so, so important that you look at what you're drinking. Cause I think one of the biggest um, barriers to this is that it's always lumped together. It's just like wine, beer, or just alcohol. And all of these studies, they're not ever looking at the alcohol percent or the type of it. Um, conventional wine, for example, in the U S it's just full of toxins and pesticides, high sugar, high alcohol. I feel so different if I'm drinking wine that I know is low sugar, low alcohol, organic, free of pesticides. I feel so different. Like it's crazy to, to the extent that I will, um, so if I'm going to a restaurant where, so at backtracking at home, I order from dry farm wines that I'm obsessed with because they test the alcohol, the wine to make sure that it's all that criteria that I just mentioned. I even subscribe to their extra low ABV line, which is 11.5% or less alcohol, which I love. So that's why I drink at home. If I'm going out, um, I try to only go places that have a substantial wine list, preferably featuring European countries. And you would be surprised because if you look on the menu, it's probably not going to say organic. And if you ask the server or the bartender, they're probably not going to know if it's organic. And I've been a server and bartender for like for a while. So I can say that. Um, if you look up the individual wineries, especially if they are in Europe, you can usually find if they're, if it's a decent wine list, you can usually find organic wineries on the wine list. So that's my first step. I find the organic wineries on the wine list. And then I look up the actual wine itself and I find the ones that are lower ABV. So I look on Google images for the label or I just Google the ABV. And then I get on the, the Vivino app and I see how people are rating it and is it dry or not. And by going through that whole process, I can usually find a wine that not probably as good as what dry from wines would make me feel the next day, but 
it makes a massive difference compared to just going and being like, I'll take the house cab. Like that's not going to go well. Um, and then just the last comment about it is if I'm going to, like, <laughs> I shouldn't even be saying this. Um, if I'm going to an event where it's, I'm going to be there, it's going to be a lot of drinking I, and it's going to be a limited wine situation. I will do what I have to do to make sure I, um, well, you know, people love like BYOB, even if it's not allowed. So I will like, not saying to sneak in wine to things, but that's a possibility as well. So basically, if you're ever at a social event, Melanie Avalon's there. Be like, hey, Melanie, where's your stash? <laughs> You'd be surprised what you can carry under dresses. Just saying. Oh, that's why you wear those big dresses. Oh, stab. I love it. I love oh this so much. I love getting those. I completely agree with you. There is no way. I'm going to be saying, okay, to the house cab. No, um, mm -hmm. I have my W set level one, which me was fun. too. No, I, I've left. Oh, I got, I got, um, actually I did that sounds bad. It sounds like I'm trying to one up you. I got level two though, but I love the W set. It was yeah, like really exciting to do it. That's so yeah. cool. They were both I think they it's, both did it. it's great to learn about wine. You know, it's kind of like an adult thing to know about. I think so when mm -hmm. you're in a situation. So you don't have a blunder and go for the house cab. <laughs> that, was that would be the worst well, how terrible that sounds how you know crass that sounds or like a house zinfandel if mm. they have that like really high alcohol wine no i'm a lot like you i will not go near a north american alcohol so whether that's wine or beer if i'm gonna have something it's always gonna be european if i'm gonna have something it's either going to be guinness for some reason my blood type i don't know what it is loves the dark Guinness. If I have one, I feel fantastic. I don't, actually don't feel anything. If I have two, I'm having a good time. Then with champagne, because it has lower sugar content and don't get it twisted with champagne and Brut and Prosecco. They're totally different. So Brut and Prosecco, really high in sugar. Champagne comes from Champagne region in France. And what I found is I can have a decent amount of champagne and still keep my cool all night, if I were to have the same um, and feel great and sleep well, if I were to have the same amount of Prosecco, I would be down for the count. No question. Or I will go for a homemade spicy margarita with 100% agave tequila. But the trick is to not overdo it and be in moderation. And this is not an every night situation. This might be one or two a week max. That's that's how I operate. So it's going to be Guinness, champagne, or tequila, or, or of course dry farm wines. It's if, if that's available. But if it's not, that's what I go for. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So um, well, probably you're probably getting a lot of silica from the Guinness. So that's good. <laughs> like we were saying, um, I think. So for most, I I think it's great that it works for you. I think a lot of people for the beer. The gluten might be an issue, um, but if it works for you, fine. What works for you? And then I'm glad you mentioned the tequila. So going the clear, if people are going that route, going the clear alcohol route is probably best. So like clear tequilas, and then you know vodka, clear vodka, gin. Um, yeah, yeah, sounds sounds good. I, I I think I just wish, like I already said this, but we just say like alcohol. But there's like so many different manifestations of that and you really can't optimize it to make it work for you. So like I drink dry from wines every night um, and when I go out, it's – I do what I've talked about. So Well, it's part of your ritual. I completely hear that. Uh, okay. So then the basic question, what are the biohacks for maybe having a little bit too much alcohol than you've had? I don't know. I had a really fun night on the town with a few of my girlfriends. One of them I hadn't seen in almost 10 years. And she's like, Rachel, you look the same. I was like, I love you. Mm -hmm. Let's hang out anytime. But I, I did end up mixing just socially. Different things were passed around. Yes, I'll enjoy. Wow, these taste delicious. I'm not used to artificial sweeteners and flavors anymore. No wonder people like these drinks because they are a bit mm -hmm. tasty. But here's the thing. I drank a ton of water. I actually brought my own in my bag. <laughs> and then I slept in my EMF clothing. I had a bath, did my skincare routine and didn't go to bed too late and still had a good sleep and actually woke up feeling pretty refreshed. 
But then I fasted until probably I'd say about two or three o'clock and just drank so much water. And this was more than I usually have. So basically that's how I, I uh, biohacked having, I think it was probably about six drinks, which is very uncharacteristic of me, but I'm having fun being social. As long as you get really good sleep, I think that um, that can be really helpful. What are some of your biohacks? If you've had a fun night out with friends, dry farm wasn't available. You made the best choices you can. What do you do before bed to hack that? Yeah. So it's interesting because so the majority, it's a lot of it is the things I would do anyways. Um, exactly. So, I mean, I'm a late night eater, so I actually eat before bed. So that, that works well for me. I know for a lot of people, I know there's a lot of debates about that. Um, but I find that coming back and having a meal actually really helps me. And then so everything I would do to support my sleep normally. And, um, it's really, really like the next day when, well, hopefully I was able to do a sauna session before going out. And then I do a sauna session every night that I can. So the next day doing sauna sessions, I just find to be a game changer, the red light. Um, I, I do daily fasting as well. So that's really amazing. And, um, I really love just wearing that, that NAD patch when I, when I go out and then if I feel like doing another one the next day as well, I used to do the, the NAD, um, injections like intermuscular injections, but I much prefer the, the patch. Cause then I can just get that slow drip, you know, while I'm, while I'm out. Oh, and then glutathione, um, not, I, I, feel, I feel really passionate about this ever since I did an interview with, um, Dr. Patel. I wonder if you know him or if you met him at the biohacking conference. Um, so he has the, the book, the glutathione revolution, and he really changed my opinion on glutathione because I used to think that people could take it orally or do IVs and such, but from reading his book and looking at the research, it doesn't really get into your cells. So you, you need a transdermal glutathione like he makes. Um, that's enough. But speaking of IVs, I do think people can, you know, getting like a sort of IV cocktail the next day can help a lot of people. Oh, and cryotherapy. Of course, that's always, that helps me so much. Um, I know Rachel's really big on cold plunges, which pra like I used praise to, to you. I used oh, right, to right, oh, right, right, right. Now you're not cold. I'm, I'm telling you, we're going to get into some season stuff and what I've noticed with no. my physical form shifting. Well, well, actually, a quick comment to that. So when I went to record with Dave, um, I asked for Ask Me Anything questions. And somebody, you actually might be the first question in the episode. Because somebody said, can you please ask Dave if, basically, can can we, can we you do a cold, bl cold plunge, Rachel Varga style, like they did? So I think you might be like the first question on that show. Um, oh, that's sweet. That was, I so. think, 11 minutes. Oh, really? I was, I legit had mild hypothermia. I've had mild hypothermia a number of times being from Canada. It's just something that happens when you're outside in the wilderness to having a great time. Sometimes if you do an outdoors cold plunge, it might take a little extra longer to get to your car when your feet aren't working properly. <laughs> so, so one of the first biohacks I ever did was cold plunging, right? For physical recovery, all of that. But what happened was I was doing it a lot, a mm -hmm. lot. And actually I did a ton of it after being in a car crash. And then I was on my way to go do a cold plunge. And then I was in a second crash. I was actually T-boned on the side. My girlfriend was driving Camaro. None of the collisions were my fault. While I was going to go cold plunge from the first crash symptoms. Wow. So what I've learned is when you're healing and you're recovery, you're really in this hypervigilant state. Your nervous system is a little bit rocked. Your body's inflamed a little bit. But once you clear out parasites, for example, you start to see things more clearly. You start to be in a more balanced state, psychologically masculine and feminine. So then I was thinking about this. Doing too much cold plunge is not going to be conducive for balance in the body. So that's why now I actually balance the cold and the heat very important. So cold shower in the AM, cold plunge in the PM, sauna session, sorry, cold plunge, cold shower in the AM, and then sauna session or a hot bath. I love Epsom salt, borax, and baking soda before bed. 
balancing those are so key. So I don't overdo it with the cold plunging anymore. However, if an opportunity presents itself, I'll do it and I can still, I still have that ability to regulate within seconds, which I actually do think is a great life skill to have so that if you're in any situation whatsoever, you can drop into a very focused state and be cool, calm and collected no matter what. Difficult situation, life event, car crash, injury, family discussion, work discussion, you can just be cool, calm and collected and gather your thoughts and not get, you know, frazzled and losing your, your breath and things like that, which used to actually happen to me. I, I hyperventilated at my first time actually speaking um, in university in front of my peers. Oh, wow. Time. Wow. Yeah. Um, well, you, that, that listener, she said that you inspired with, with that now that I know that that was like a, a really intense moment for you. Um, she said she, you inspired her into the, I think she said like the river by her house or something. So, um, I love it. Yeah, I hope she balanced it with the warmth. Balance, I know balancing. Balancing uh, that's, is key. And actually I, I, I'm similar. Like I do. So I do, like I said, I don't do cold punches, but I do cryotherapy with, with the cold air during the day. And that's then- better though. Because you actually don't get as cold and it's so much faster. Yeah. That's, I mean, I can see how it would be, hearing what you're saying, I can see how it would be much more potentially, I like, cause it's a very brief, quick, intense stimulus. Um, and it just makes me feel like I haven't experienced any negative effects from it. It just it's like you're going to Everest really great. three minutes. Mm-hmm. Three minutes. Um, so I do that and then I, I, then I do the sauna every night. So getting that balance for sure. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, this has been a really fun interview. We've gone a little bit over. Thank you so much for your time here. This has actually been one of my favorite episodes to record. I don't think I've laughed so much in an interview. Mm -hmm. Do you have any final thoughts or comments um, to support our audience here on the School of Radiance podcast? Any final closing words? Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. This was so fun. And I can't wait. You're coming back on my show. And I don't know when. It's in the books. So I'm really excited. Um, so that's really exciting. Um, final thoughts. I just, I really want to empower people. Um, there are so, because I think it can be, well, a few different things. One, people can get really stuck in health conditions or feel like their body is a certain way and that they can't get out of it. Um we talked earlier about like the seasons and things like, I think there are seasons of people's lives. There are, you know, seasons in the year. So everything is okay is what I'm trying to say. And, um, regardless of where you're at, um, things can always change and do change. And there's so many potential biohacking things that you can try. I encourage people to not get overwhelmed, like try what resonates, um, keep, can keep what resonates, keep what resonates, leave what doesn't, don't feel like you have to be committed to any one certain thing. Like just be open, I think is so, so important. Um, so yeah, I'm just so grateful that we live in a time that we live in right now with all of that, because it, there's a lot of agency and power and awesome things. So yes. beautiful. Very well stated. I know we didn't get a chance to talk about what our thoughts are on experiencing the four seasons as biohackers and also looking at it from the longevity perspective, but maybe you all are just going to have to stay tuned for the next time that Melanie and I reconnect. Thank you so much for being here on the show. I know you're working on some incredible things behind the scenes. So please take the time now to tell everyone how they can learn more with you. Check out some of the things that you're innovating, your supplements, your products, how they can follow you on social media and your show. Sure. And again, thank you, Rachel, for having me. I really appreciate it. So I'm Melanie Avalon on all the handles, melanieavalon.com. You can get my supplement line, which I created because I'm neurotic about ingredients and fillers and purity and potency. Um, That's at avalonx.us. And then the EMF blocking product line, which may or may not be out when this airs, but the website people can go to will be avalonx.u wait avalonxemf.us um and then i also have i can't say what it is yet but i have i've started work on the biggest project yet to date of my entire life so 
I can't really say anything more, but it's really, really exciting. I think um, I know what it is, and it's very exciting. So everybody better really? stay tuned. I haven't told. I haven't told. I wonder if you do know. Oh. Um, I don't know if you oh. do. Okay. Well, maybe. Or it, maybe it's just a little psychic intuition. It involves the app world. Oh, yes. No, I'm thinking of something else that you and I have been talking about for a while. I thought it was that. <laughs> another thing you're working on behind the scenes. Anything oh, so is, many things is going to be really helpful. Melanie, I love what you're doing. I love the fun. I love the, you know, you just, you show how much fun you're having in life. Now I know why you wear all these big dresses. You, you're packing underneath that. Good for you. An entire wine bottle underneath there. It's my skill. It is my skill. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's so funny. I love this. I love this. Yeah. I adore and, you. And, and I, I will tell you, you I just, one last thing for listeners, one last tip. Not that I endorse this and not that I'm doing this and not that you should do this, but if you do try that sneak in the wine thing and if you do get pulled over and it does fall out of your dress, just tell them you have to drink organic wine to feel better and they might like you still they might let you still bring it in. Oh, okay. Here we go. A little <laughs> BTS of contraband. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, you're so funny. So. You're so funny. Well, I love you so much. Love what you're doing. Really excited for things that are coming for you. Wishing you all the best and looking forward to our upcoming interview as well. And please share with everybody again your shows. Sure. So the Melanie Avalon biohacking podcast, that's what Rachel's been on and she'll be on again. That's guest interviews and um, the intermittent fasting podcast all about, all about intermittent fasting. And then actually, by the time this comes out, my third podcast might be out. I'm launching the Mind Blown podcast. So that's my first non-health related show. And I'm very excited. Oh, I'm intrigued. I'll have to check that one out as well. I actually also have a third show in the mix too. Oh, really? It's a little top secret. Do it. It happens top secret. when you're a podcaster. <laughs> You just have fun having conversations. I know. Yeah. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining here. We're at an hour and 11 minutes and 44 seconds. This is a perfect time to conclude. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Be sure to subscribe and share this episode with a family member, a friend, a loved one, and learn more about ways that you can connect further with Melanie and I in the description of this episode and also over at theschoolofradiance.com. I love to help you get the best hair, skin, and nails of your life. So the ways to pursue that are going to be through great skincare products that I've pre-vetted, one-on-one sessions, my skin tutorials, taking you from basic to advanced tutorials that I don't share anywhere else, and of course, my membership for how to show up as your most beautiful, radiant version in any situation and feel confident to build your community. Thank you everyone for joining us right here on the School of Radiance podcast.